Aloha, namaste, and welcome again to, today will be the Krishna book reading, chapter four. We are reading through the compiling of the Srimad Bhagavatam into the Krishna book by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And today what I'm going to do is read, start reading chapter one. We have been reading the introduction by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And if you want to hear more about those, I have those on my YouTube channel listed Krishna book reading one, two, and three. So we're going to get right into it today. Uh, as usual, we will start with Kirtan meditation. Kirtan meditation is as taught by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as, a, as the way and means by achieving self-realization in this day and age. You don't have to do anything very difficult in meditation. You don't have to go off to the forest to meditate. You don't have to spend money, lots of money to learn difficult meditation techniques. It's a free practice and the most effective by hearing and engaging in the mantras. Mantras mean, uh, uh, come from two words, man, which means mind, and tra, which means to draw away or to liberate. So the spiritual sound vibrations, they're spiritual sound vibrations. They're not material. It's not like you would, if you were to say something like peanut butter, you might like peanut butter and think, oh yeah, I like peanut butter. But if you were to say peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter it would just drive you crazy. But the mantras, instead of getting older and driving you nuts, they actually draw you in. You may not be initially attracted to them in the beginning, but after a while you find that they're very effective and very attractive to you. They help clear your mind. They help give you a piece of understanding and self-realization, a realization about the things and the questions in your mind that is because the spiritual sound vibrations are not different than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So just like a person's name doesn't necessarily mean that that is that person. I have the name James, but there are many other people who have the name James. It's more of a label, but with the names of the Supreme, like Krishna, Gopala, Govinda, their name is the same as themselves. So by hearing and repeating the names and the attributes of the Supreme, you are bringing a awakeness in your heart and understanding of your relationship with him. So we're gonna get into the chapter. So I'm just gonna chant a little bit and I offer my respects to everyone here who joined me and I offer respects to my spiritual teacher who taught me these processes. So sit back and listen first time through. The second time through, I'll continue to sing. You just repeat it back to me and sing along with me.
Hari is the name of the supreme. It also means one, means a thief. A thief. Because singing, giving your attention and your love to the supreme, Krishna is a thief. He steals it all. He wants all your love. And this is actually the soul's delight. It is our natural function. It's our eternal function and it's what gives us the true happiness so as we give more and more we want to keep giving more and more and we're going to continue now chapter one of the krishna book is entitled advent of lord krishna once the world was overburdened by the unnecessary defense force of different kings who were actually demons but were posing themselves as the royal order. At that time, the whole world became perturbed, and the predominating deity of this earth, known as Bhumi, 
went to see Lord Brahma to tell her of calamities due to demoniac kings. It's a very important point to note that in the Vedic tradition, there is, there's more than one mother. There are actually seven mothers. And besides the original mother, your mother, your own mother, the planet Earth is also considered our mother. And you should protect your mother. The cows are also the mother. And so in this case, the predominating deity assumed the shape of a cow. So we say here, Bhumi assumed the shape of a cow and presented herself before Lord Brahma with tears in her eyes. So Lord Brahma is the predominating demigod, creator god of the universe. Administrator, I guess you could say, of the universe. She was bereaved and was weeping just to invoke the Lord's companion. She related the calamitous position of the earth, and after hearing this, Lord Brahma became much aggrieved, and he at once started for the ocean of milk, where Lord Vishnu resides. Lord Brahma was accompanied by the demigods headed by Lord Shiva and Bhuma. Bhumi also followed. Arriving on the shore of the milk ocean, Lord Brahma began to pacify the Lord Vishnu, who formally saved the earthly planet by assuming the transcendental form of a boar. In the Vedic mantras, there is a particular type of prayer called Purusha Shukta. Generally, the demigods offer their obeisances unto Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by chanting the Purusha Shukta. It is understood herein that the predominating deity of every planet can see the Lord of this universe, Brahma, whenever there is some disturbance in his planet. So just like in a company, you have different positions of managers and, you know, supervisors, and um, there are predominating um, living entities who are in the positions of administrators in different parts of the universe. They refer to them as deities or demigods, but they're not actually God. They're actually living entities embodied, just like we are embodied in a body. They, have, they just happen to have more power within this universe to administer it. There is a planet, and Brahma, sorry, and Brahma can approach the Supreme Lord Vishnu not by seeing him directly, but by standing on the shore of the ocean of milk. There is a planet within this universe called Sweta Dweep, and on that planet there is an ocean of milk. It is understood from various lit Vedic literature that, the, that there is an ocean of salt water within, just as there is an ocean of salt water within this planet, there are various kinds of oceans in other planets. Somewhere there is an ocean of milk, somewhere there is an ocean of oil, somewhere there is an ocean of liquor, and many other types of oceans. Purusha Shukta is a standard prayer which the demigods recite to appease the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Kashira Dakshai Vishnu, because he is lying on the ocean of milk. He is called Kashira Dakshai Vishnu. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead through, through whom all the incarnations within this universe appear. After all the demigods offered the Purusha Shukta prayer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they apparently heard no response. Then Lord Brahma personally sat in meditation and there was a message transmission from Lord Vishnu to Brahma. So all things are received through sound vibration, just as the Omkara sound, Om, is the the sound incarnation of the supreme personality of god as the sound om similarly how transcendental knowledge is also received through sound waves by the teacher to the student the supreme personality of god that transmits a sound to the creator deity of this universe lord brahma brahma then broadcast the message to the demigods that is a system of receiving Vedic knowledge. The Vedic knowledge is received first from Brahma, from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, through the medium of the heart. 
as stated in the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Tene Brahma Hrida, the transcendental knowledge of the Vedas was transmitted to Lord Brahma through the heart. Here also in the same way, only Brahma could understand the message transmitted by Lord Vishnu, and he broadcast it to the demigods for their immediate action. The message was, the Supreme Personality of Godhead will appear on earth very soon along with his supreme powerful potencies. And as long as he remains on the earth planet to execute his mission of annihilating the demons and establishing the devotees, the demigods should also remain there to assist him. They should all immediately take birth in the family of the Yadu dynasty, wherein the Lord will also appear in due course of time. The Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, Krishna, personally appeared as the son of Vasudeva. Before he appeared, all the demigods, along with their wives, appeared in different pious families in the world just to assist the Lord in executing his mission. The exact word used here is tatpriyagartam, which means the demigods should appear on the earth in order to please the Lord. In other words, any living entity who lives only to satisfy the Lord is a demigod. The demigods <coughs> were further informed that the plenary portion of Lord Krishna, Ananta, who is maintaining the universal planets by extending his millions of hoods, would also appear on earth before Lord Krishna's appearance. They were also informed that the external potency of Vishnu, Maya, with whom all the conditioned souls are enamored, would also appear just to execute the purpose of the Supreme Lord. After instructing and pacifying all the demigods, as well as Bhumi with sweet words, Lord Brahma, the father of all Prajapatis, or progenitors of universal population, departed for his own abode, the highest material planet called Brahma Loka. The leader of the Yadu dynasty, King Shurashana was ruling over the country known as Mathura, the district of Mathura, as well as the district known as Shurashana. On account of the rule of King Shurashana, Mathura became the capital city of all the kings of the Yadus. Mathura was also made the capital of the kings of the Yadu dynasty because the Yadus were a very pious family and knew that Mathura is the place where Lord Sri Krishna lives eternally, just as he also lives in Dwarka. Getting on to the next part of the story, let's see what time is, okay. Once upon a time, Vasudev, son of Shurashena, just after marrying Devaki, was going home on his chariot with his newly wedded wife. The father of Devaki, known as Devaka, had contributed a sufficient dowry because he was very affectionate towards his daughter. He had contributed hundreds of chariots completely decorated with gold equipment. At that time, Kamsa, the son of Ugarashena, in order to please his sister Devaki, had voluntarily taken the reins of the horses of Vasudev's chariot and was driving. According to the custom of the Vedic civilization, when a girl is married, the brother takes his sister and brother-in-law to their home. <clears throat> because the newly married girl may feel too much separation from her father's family, the brother goes with her until she reaches her father-in-law's house. The full dowry contributed by Devaka was as follows. 400 elephants, fully decorated with golden garlands, 15,000 decorated horses, and 1,800 chariots. He also arranged for 200 beautiful girls to follow his daughter. The Kshatriya system of marriage, still current in India, dictates that when a Kshatriya is married, a few dozen of the bride's young girlfriends, in addition to the bride, go to the house of the king. The followers of the queen are called maidservants, but actually they act as friends of the queen. This practice is prevalent from time immemorial, traceable at least to the time before the advent of Lord Krishna 5,000 years ago. So Vasudev brought home another 200 beautiful girls along with his wife. While the bride and bridegroom were passing along the chariot, there were different kinds of musical instruments playing to indicate the auspicious moment. There were conch shells, bugles, drums, and kettle drums, Combined together, they were vibrating a nice concert. The process was, was passing very pleasingly, and Kamsa was driving the chariot when suddenly 
There was a miraculous sound vibrated from the sky, which especially announced to Kamsa, Kamsa, you are such a fool. You are driving the chariot of your sister and your brother-in-law, but you do not know that the eighth child of this sister will kill you. Kamsa was the son of Ugrashena of the Boja dynasty. It is said that Kamsa was the most demoniac of all the Boja dynasty kings. Immediately after hearing the prophecy from the sky, he caught hold of Devaki's hair and was just about to kill her with his sword. Vasudev was astonished at Kamsa's behavior in order to pacify the cruel, shameless brother-in-law, he began to speak as follows, with great reason and evidence. He said, My dear brother-in-law Kamsa, you are the most famous king of the Boja dynasty, and people know that you are the greatest warrior and a valiant king. How is it that you are so infuriated that you are prepared to kill a woman who is your own sister at this auspicious time of her marriage? Why should you be so much for afraid of death? Death is already born along with your birth. From the very day you took your birth, you began to die. Suppose you are 25 years old. That means you have already died 25 years. Every moment, every second, you are dying. Why then should you be so much afraid of death? Final death is inevitable. You may die either today or in 100 years. You cannot avoid death. Why should you be so much afraid? Actually, death means annihilation of the present body. As soon as the present body stops functioning and mixes with the five elements of material nature, the living entity within the body accepts another body according to his present action and reaction. It is just as when a man walks on the street, he puts, for his, puts forward his foot, and when he is confident that his foot is situated on sound ground, he lifts another foot. In this way, one after another, the body changes and the soul transmigrates. See how the plant worms change from one twig to another so carefully? Similarly, the living entity changes his body as soon as the higher authorities decide on his next body. As long as the living entity is conditioned within this material world, he must take material, material bodies one after another. His next particular body is offered by the laws of nature according to the actions and reactions of this life. The bo this body is exactly like one of the bodies which we always see in dreams. During our dream of sleep, we create so many bodies according to mental creation. We have seen gold and we have also seen a mountain. So in the dream, we can see a golden mountain by combining the two ideas. Sometimes in dreams, we see that we have a body which is flying in the sky. And at that time, we completely forget our present body. Similarly, these bodies are changing. When you have one body, you forget the past body. During a dream, we may make contact with so many new kinds of bodies, but when we are awake, we forget them all. And actually, these material bodies are the creations of our mental activities. But at the present moment, we do not really re recollect our past bodies. So this is a, a little bit of, about the, na the nature of the, the soul and the nature, the separation, the, the differences between the, the soul and the body and the subtle body, which includes mind, false ego, and intelligence. And the nature of the mind is flickering. Sometimes it accepts something and immediately rejects the same thing. Accepting and rejecting is the process of the mind in contact with the five objects of sense gratification, form, taste, smell, sound, and touch. In its speculative way, the mind comes in touch with the object, objects of sense gratification, and when the living entity desires a particular type of body, he gets it. <clears throat> Therefore, the body is an offering by the laws of material nature. The living entity accepts the body and comes out again into the material world to enjoy or suffer according to the construction of the body. Unless we have a particular type of body, we cannot enjoy or suffer according to our mental proclivities inherited from the previous life. The particular type of body is actually offered to us according to our mental condition at the time of death. So there's a little bit, there's a lot there to that. And actually what we do with our mind, in other words, our mind is a separate 
identity. It's not actually part of ourselves. So this just comes with the science of identity, understanding that first, we are not our body. Our bodies are consistently changing. Every molecule and every atom, three to five years, is cons consistently changing over so that in a lifetime, we may actually have up to seven or eight different bodies. And we can see that by the, the fact that we have, you know, a baby body, and then we have a, a youth body, and then we have a, a, a man, young man's body, and then we have a middle-aged body, and then we have an old body. But we're actually the same person through the whole thing. The body is consistently chemically changing around us, but we consistently stay the same. We're also not our mind. The mind is, is consistently changing. We can understand that by the fact that we change our mind con consistently. The mind does not change itself. We change our mind. If we, sit, we see something and maybe we're, for example, we see somebody who makes us mad and we want to, the mind says, I want to beat that person up. But you say, no, I'm not going to beat that person up. You change your mind. And so the mind, what is put into the mind and how we act according to what is, what the mind dictates will shape that the mind, will shape the mind will also continually shape the body for a future body in our next life. And we'll get more into that because that's a very deep subject about the, the idea of transmigration of the soul and reincarnation. Uh, so what that I'm going to stop there in that chapter one of the advent of Lord Krishna and do some more kirtan. Uh, feel free to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and uh, share if you have any questions you want to add in the commentary about the philosophy that we're reading about from this book. Feel free. I'll try to do my best to answer those questions. So let's go ahead and chant a little bit. Thank you very much.
your guitar. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me for that next uh, Christian book reading four, and we will see you tomorrow. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye.